Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Road to Cheltenham. Really looking forward to this week because fresh from imagining the Sporting Life Arkle last week, we're going to try and imagine in our mind the Unibet champion hurdle, aren't we, Ruby? We're going to give it a go, in here, Lydia. Um, <laughs> I think these are the kind of videos we'll be wanting people to delete forever when these races are run and it proves just how wrong we really were. But um, we'll give it a go for the time being. I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> well, Forever on the internet. I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we can get in first and, and point out our own mistakes. That might be the, the best way forward, I think. We're not afraid to do that. That is true. That is true. Right. OK, well, let's start in the obvious place then from the evidence that we gained from the weekend, which was the Kingwell hurdle. It featured the return of Goshen up against Song for Someone, who's one of the approvers this season, and also Navajo Pass, who took down the twice champion hurdle winner Bouvardere at Haydock last time. Yeah, and look, I, I think the more you thought about it or looked at it, it was kind of the result everyone was hoping for. And, you know, Goshen lined up and jumped out and you're thinking, what's going to happen today? But from the get-go, Song for Someone was on the back foot. Even very early in the race, Aidan Coleman was having to give him a nudge and a dig. But when they got up to the first hurdle, Goshen went ever so slightly to his right and he went across a little bit, jumped it really well. And the same on the run to the second hurdle. He kind of has a little look around and goes a bit right. Whereas, and then when they jump that and head up past the stands in Wing Canton, you can see Aidan Coleman never got comfortable. He's always squeezing at, at, at Song for Someone. Into the back straight, Goshen gets in tight to the fourth hurdle but he's very very quick at it and I, to me it was the best I ever saw Goshen jumping he was even in or out he was very good but he did have that tendency to go a bit to his right and it was even evident again at the second last where he goes off to his right and again at the last now he did it last year in Sandown and in Ascot he went a bit to his right so he's always done it but it was the best he jumped his galloping was relentless and he hit the line a very strong horse a long way in front of a good yardstick and song for someone um, and he get, and Jamie Moore couldn't pull him up. It was a really uh, it was great to see, and it adds a bit of spice to to the champion hurdle. And um, I for one was delighted to watch it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And also Jamie Moore's interview afterwards, in which he talked about how Gary Moore has really slathered attention on this horse since his uh, poor run in the international hurdle. He started riding him differently, heading him out into the lanes around where they train, and making sure that the horse is actually enjoying his training. Yeah, and you could see it in him. Now, he is a relentless galloper, and one would imagine that is how they will revert to, to riding him come champion hurdle day. Um, it'll be much different ground. He'd probably be able to travel a bit sweeter even than he did in the Kingwell. There were times you were thinking, God, is he going as fast as he can? But um, I think Ocean's gallop is a pretty strong one. Yeah, and that really does mean that both Honeysuckle and Epitant are going to have to be on their game because this is top class form it is it is top class form he is only a five-year-old but he looks to have bounced right back to himself and how about song for someone afterwards tom simmons wasn't necessarily counting out uh, the champion hurdle but that's quite it's not as a, a flat track like wing canton but the ground is likely not to be as deep um but it's still a, a relative speed test i know he has kempton form when he won the kingwell but he's cheltenham form and the international is on the new course. That's stamina. And to me, he looked like a horse that wants further, a good bit further. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see whether eventually Tom Simmons decides on going for the entry hurdle over two and a half miles. So uh, there's the impact on the Unibet champion hurdle betting. We should say that Sanwa is the last year's county hurdle winner, is out of the champion hurdle. A trainer, Willie Mullins, and owner JP Manners had a chat about how the horse has been performing um, this season and felt that he's just not up to the grade. Uh, but James de Burley, uh, Ruby, who we did discuss earlier in the series uh, from Willie Mullins' yard, might be making his, well, uh, I was about to say Irish debut, UK debut. Uh, he, he's from France, so about, to, about to make his debut in the champion hurdle potentially. Yeah, deb, debut out of France. Yeah. Um, but his horse has ridden from off the pace in France, and I can't see that really changing this year's champion hurdle when you look at the amount of pace that's in it. But um, he's only a five year old, a bit like Gaussian. Be a big ass for him, Lydia. First mm. time uh, run outside of France to go and win the champion hurdle. But he's a nice horse, but I think he was bought with chasing in mind for next season. And um, I don't know, a bit like Footpad. He was fought in the champion hurdle before he went to win the Arkle. That'll definitely be his road. And the tempo, the, the style of racing, the obstacles, they're different from France to, to Ireland and England. It can take a while for horses to acclimatise, can't it? Yeah, it, it, it can. Um, and especially going in the deep end in the champion hurdle. But yeah. that's the kind of rating he has. And that's where he's going to have to go. But 
Uh, his jumping shouldn't be an issue. Um, he jumps really well. I, I've ridden him, worked myself. Um, he has plenty of pace. He's, he's a pretty straightforward horse. So, but could I tell you he's going to win a champion hurdle or not? That I don't know. Can we talk about Sharjah? Because the news has come out this week that sadly amateurs are not going to be able to take part at the Cheltenham Festival in 2021. That's due to the UK government's guidelines on elite sports, which the BHA is adhering to. That does pose a problem for uh, Sharjah, whose usual rider is Patrick Mullins. I think he's ridden him nine of his last 10 starts. Um, there was there have been rumours knocking around, Ruby, that Patrick might switch his status from amateur to professional. Is that likely? I don't know, Lydia, and I didn't really ask him, and I could have asked him this morning, but it's a bit like looking at a kid on at Christmas time, and they know the sleigh is landing in Ireland, but it's not going to venture into County Carlo. So you can move house, but you might be able to come home for a good few months to get your presents, but you stay where you are. And I just didn't really feel like asking him this morning, to be honest with you. Um, it would be a huge decision for him, and it won't. It'll be one that he won't take lightly. Um, it, it's a massive, massive call. But look, Sharjah, I think Paul Townend, or I know Paul Townend won a Morgiana hurdle on him, so yeah. um, I think it would be pretty straightforward in that sense. But. I think it is a big blow for, for Pat. He, I don't think it, I know. It must be a, a massive blow for Patrick and Jamie and Derek O'Connor and the rest of the amateurs, uh, both on this side of the Irish Sea and over there on your side. Um, it is a, 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 a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it really is. And it won't be the same without them as well. They really add to the festival. But I'm going to have to, that Christmas, that Santa Claus analogy, that Christmas analogy, you, you totally lost me. What is the downside of Patrick switching from amateur to professional? Because as I understand it, under Irish rules, you can switch back. Is that right? Yeah, but it won't be switching back overnight. He could switch back, but there would be a period of time where he would have to be neutral, I suppose, the best way of putting it. Um, he can't just turn for Bunchestown and turn back amateur the following week uh, there is a, a considerable cooling off period in the middle and um, that would be could be quite lengthy and does it depend on what he achieves as a non-amateur no he can only ride 25 winners as a non-amateur if he rides more than 25 winners as a professional he can't turn back anyway mm. but um, it doesn't matter if it's only for one day or if he does it for eight weeks the cooling off period is the, the, the turning back period is still quite substantial and if he rides over 25 winners, he can't. OK, thank you for expl explaining that to me. Um, right, OK, uh, let us discuss and envisage the Unibet champion hurdle. And, and you've um, gone back and looked at two different champion hurdles that were running contrasting styles. We've got Annie Powers' victory in the 2016 champion hurdle and Epitant's victory in last year's race. Yeah, and look, if we watch them coming onto the track and, and lining up, they're, they're, they're quite similar in that there's three or four horses going to line up in boat races to go forward. So you had Annie Power, Nichols Canyon, Identity Thief, Lil Rockefeller, and the new one in, the, in Annie Power's race. And in last year's race, then you had Petty Mouchoir, Cornerstone Lad, Darver Star, Gumball, and Not So Sleepy. Now, admittedly, it was a standing start last year, so Not So Sleepy gets left behind. So they break through the tape, and Petty Mouchoir picks up the running. Annie Power goes forward and gets the better of Nichols Canyon and the new one as they jump the first hurdle, and they really rub her on down towards the second. And my 10 to yours is the interesting one in Annie Power's race. He sat fifth or sixth between the first and the second hurdle. Epitant is in a pretty similar position last year. But if we roll it around the bend as they turn into the back straight, and we just pause it for a second, you'll see Annie Power, Nichols Canyon, the new one, and my tent to yours, four horses with identity thief on the back of them, have pulled clear of the rest of the field. In last year's race, it was Petit Mouchoir and Cornerstone Lad who had gotten a bit clear on the front of Darver Star, Gumball, and Epitante sitting in there in the pocket. Now, essentially, Barry Garrity is controlling that race because the two in front were pretty big prices. This is, this is Epitant, he's controlling. Epitant, yeah, he's riding Epitant. He's controlling the race because Petit Mouchoir and Cornerstone Lad, even though they're slipping away in front of him, they're pretty big prices and he's not unduly concerned about them. Whereas in the pre, in the 2016 champion hurdle with Annie Power, Nichols Canyon, my tend to yours, the new one, they're the four fancied horses, yeah. the four big ones, and they all race forward together. So the ones behind couldn't keep up and the pace was relentless on the front end. The race, essentially, in the Annie Power race, I remember watching this live and, and remarking on it. The, the race broke into two halves, didn't it? It was the, the first division race and the second division race. 
I think it was. So and even if you're holding it just there in the back straight and you look at this year's race, so you can put Goshen in any powers position, you put Honeysuckle in the new ones position, you can put Aspire Tower into where my tend to your my tend to yours ends up and Silver Streak in where Nicholas Canyons is. There's four very good horses on the front end. There's no way that the other horses can allow those four to get away from them. So Epitant. Uh, Bouvardet, James de Burley, Salier, they're all going to have to bridge that gap and keep this race condensed because they're not going to make up the ground on the ones in the fr- uh, on the front end. Charge will be right at the back. He'll have to hope for a bit of luck. But but I think that this race, with so many good horses going to be on the front at the front, one of them, if not two of them, are going to keep going. And that'll mean the lads who like to ride hold-up horses are going to have to ride them a bit closer. Uh, Patrick Mullins held uh, road charge really cold last year didn't he and he was reflecting after the horse's win over christmas that he needs to sit a little bit closer to epitant so it sounds like whoever rides charger there again they get, they're not going to be able to drop out in the same way are they no because even if we play that those two champion hurdles onto the top of the hill and as they turn at the top of the hill and just freeze it you see petty mouchoir going off the top of the hill last year in front of darver star but barry garrity was in no rush and epitant to keep tabs on petty mouchoir he's waiting for the horses behind him Whereas when Annie Power turns off the top of the hill, Barry's right on her tail. Paul Townend's right up on her tail on Nichols Canyon. Like she's a big, she's a she was the threat. So in this, and if you look for Charge in last year's Champion Hurdle, where he is, he'd no problem catching Petit Mouchoir, but he could never get that epitant. So I think this would be a race that's going to suit those that have the pace to travel close to the front. Goshen, Honeysuckle, um, Epitant's going to have to be a little closer than she was last year. I think it's going to suit those horses. Maybe Espire Tower could improve enough, but that, that's that's still up in the air. But I do think this is a race for, it'll be more of a 2016 race than last year's race where Epitown came from halfway, but Sharjah came from the very back. I can't see this race working out like that. When we were talking about the 2016 champion hurdle, I was talking about that section in the race where Identity Thief is trying to cling on to the front four. Top Notch is trying to make the break from the second division to the first division and they can't quite get there. And you were saying that that was the difference between pace and speed. And I've actually had a, a tweet about this asking me, uh, asking you to explain what you mean. What, what, what is the difference between pace and speed? Well, Identity Thief had the speed in the first two furlongs to keep up but he didn't have the pace to maintain it. So I, I suppose Usain Bolt is speed, Michael Johnson is pace, a uh, 400 meter runner. So it's pace is to be able to maintain a very high gallop. Your cruising speed is your pace. A speed is a turn of foot that you can show acceleration, but to have a lot of pace, a honeysuckle looks to have plenty of pace. Goshen has huge pace. Um, Any power at massive pace. So it might tend to yours, but, you need pace is the ability to jump and set a pace and get up to a high speed and maintain it. And very good horses can do that. And that's why pace horses more than speed horses win a Supreme, a Vatour, a Champagne Fever. They get up to a very high cruising speed that they can maintain the pace. So let's talk about some individuals. Uh, Goshen, you mentioned at the start of this section, his tendency to go out to his right. He's shown it in the Kingwell. He's shown it last season as well. He's now on the tighter old course he's only raced at Cheltenham on the new course which is more galloping where in the champion hurdle might that become an issue um become an issue if you missed the fourth last if you went very right and missed the fourth last as a climb in the hill it would just be the wrong hurdle to do it at but on reflection of his triumph hurdle at speed he probably doesn't go as right as he does when he's been slowed down a little and aspire tower he struggled for much of, of the triumph do you just put that down to a blip on the day I do. I think Rachel Blackmore never thought he was the same horse last year. Um, we haven't seen him since Christmas, but he's a horse that can go a really good gallop. And I think a really strong and run champion hurdle would suit him. Christmas didn't in Leperstown. But uh, look, he has a bit to improve. There's no doubt about that. But he's just probably a slightly forgotten horse. Now, they changed tactics on Silver Streak brilliantly in the Christmas hurdle. Do you think those are the tactics, well, you did say, you think those are the tactics they're going to try and a- adopt with him this time round rather than dropping him in? Is he going to be able to, to, to stay there, do you think? I don't know, but you should never fix something that's not broken. And I think, right, the way they rode him in the Christmas hurdle showed that he's a horse with pace and that's what they used. And I think he'll go forward. Do I envisage him making the running? Not necessarily, but I don't envisage him being out of the first four all the way either. 
and he stayed really well at Kempton, I could see him being ridden that way. And do you think Honeysuckle has the pace, the speed to get a position and the pace to hold it? I think Rachel will neutralise that riding her a bit wide. She always rides her a bit wide anyway, so that she will ride her a little bit to the right-hand side of the field to give herself the room, whereby if she does end up sixth or seventh after jumping the first, she won't encounter traffic problems. She'll want to maintain an even gallop. She'll sit in in the bend around by the stands, but if the mare then starts to pick up and build up, she'll be able to roll forward as she wishes. I couldn't see her going down the inner runner. And if you're Aidan Colin on Epitant, who are you Who are you watching? Are you watching Goshen or are you watching Honeysuckle? You're watching them all, um, <laughs> basically. And I think he'll have to put himself in a position fifth, sixth, whereby if Honeysuckle doesn't perform in the day and have the pace, that he's able to cover Goshen, or Goshen himself. He can't go out with the mentality of just, I'll follow Honeysuckle, she'll bring me to Goshen and we'll win the race. Because if something happens to her, he has to be able to cover Goshen himself. And so you're, it sounds like you're backing Goshen in your mind to, to break this race open, that he is going to be the, the key player in it. I am. Um, most races need, some. most races uh, contract when somebody slows it down. And I just can't see Goshen slowing this race down anywhere. No, absolutely. And so, all right, then give it me from, from two out in, in your mind. In my mind, I think Goshen will still be in front and it will be the fairy tale result. But after watching Honeysuckle of late, I think she'll outstay him and every time won't get to them. Fascinating. Right. Well, uh, we'll play that back in a, about a month's time and we can point out the mistakes. <laughs>there's a Limini or a Led Stance or a Lorena involved. And the three of those were pretty sharp price favourites. Um, he obviously then won it last year with Concertista when he had Carl Reavy as backup. But I think the year before is probably the more interesting one when Eglantine the Soy won it. Now, I know she beat Concertista at Willie Mullins' as well, but they were any price you like when he had to throw a lot of darts at the race to try and find the winner. This year, he has Galois and Hookup, but I think Rosie's Hollow, Royal Kahala, the glancing queen, and maybe a few more. I think there's opposition to Willie this year. Okay, so we're we're not looking at so Limity was odds on when she won, wasn't she? Um, yeah. Let's dance was eleven to eight, um, four to seven. Lorena, but she won by eighteen lengths. Canton, and although Concertista wasn't the favourite, she ended up winning by twelve lengths, and she beat a stable companion. So yeah, she was nine to two, and she beat Dalcita. Uh, Colerivi was fourth. Was, you know they were pretty good mares, but looking at this year, look, Gal was. And hook up both have life chances, don't get me wrong. Mm. But I think there is definitely stern opposition. Okay, so it could be more wide open. Maybe not as wide open as Eglantine de Soy's win at 50 to 1, beating Ponsus Easter at 66s, but wide open nonetheless. Well, there was another big performance at the weekend, and this came from a horse that didn't actually win. It was Champ, who had the unconventional gold cup preparation of being dropped back to two miles for the betfair game spirit and ruby he ran an absolute stormer finishing second to so royal i don't think there was anything not to like about it lydia and the further it went the more you probably liked it uh nico lined him up good and handy down the inside went to the first screwed a little bit in the air um but nothing untoward of that fraction to his left and at the second fence he's actually a bit lucky because he over jumps it and lands out in his head but Nico gets him right back onto his hocks. Into the back straight, Dolos is right behind him. Grenatine has dropped in. He was brave at the fifth. He made a six fence in his stride. But by the seventh fence, it was absolutely perfect. Just flicks out over the top of it. Really, really nice to watch. And then if you watch him to the cross fence, and if we could even highlight Nico's hands going to it, he, he doesn't have to take him back or send him forward. Nico's hands stay right on his neck. The horse was sure of what he was doing. He's on a half stride, but he takes it himself and gets out over it. He's going to need to do that at the speed he did it to win the Gold Cup. Um, three out, jumps a bit to his left. Again at the second last to his left, so Royal is challenging him all the way up. And at the last fence, when Nico asks for a stride, the horse finds his own half a stride. I know he goes left, but gets himself out of it. Like we saw him gallop on and throw himself into the second last in the dipper. 
he learned from that because he got himself out of it at the second last. And with a really good jump, he might even have beaten Sorai. But Sorai look must be a wonderful horse to own. I'd say since the day Simon Manier and Isaac Sawed have bought him, I doubt they've had to pay for a training bill. He just keeps winning money and prize money. A little short in the top grade, but he's a must be a really enjoyable horse to own. Yeah, he, it was great to see him in the winning enclosure. I think that was his first victory since he won the Schler, uh, first run out of Novice Company. But he's had a few goes at grade ones and he's just falls slightly short. Um, Alan King was saying afterwards that if they go to the Cheltenham Festival, it will be if the ground is not too soft and he'll be going for the Queen Mother Champion Chase, not the Champion Hurdle, for which he also has an entry. He might wait for Aintree. But back to Champ. You mentioned him jumping left, which he did at quite a few fences. That's not the first time he's done it. I think he's done it a little bit last season. Is that an issue? He did do it last year, yeah. When he went to the RSA, he didn't. Um, and if he did, it was very, very slight. I don't think it is. I think if he was coming to Punchestown, you'd be worried. I wouldn't be at all worried about him going left on the Gold Cup track, especially with the way Cheltenham have it set up with fresh ground down the inside. You want to be in on that anyway. So going left is a slight advantage. One caught a star I used to go a bit left. Absolutely. Uh, so the jumping they've clearly worked on and it, it has worked. He's been um, to Henrietta Knight's schooling academy. Um, how about his keenness? Now, they wanted to drop to this trip, not only so that he didn't have a hard race over three miles, but also to hopefully that he wouldn't be, um, if he was fresh on his first run for a long time, that he'd be able to sort of settle into it, which again, I think worked. How about then going up to three mile, two and a half furlongs? Is he going to settle? I think he will. It, it, it's, it's a strange one. It's like, uh, I don't know. It, 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 that would have taken the fizz out of him, the yeah. excitement out of him. He will be uh, more manageable in the Gold Cup. Now, Nico will still have to get a little bit of cover somewhere. He won't line him up and get him between two horses racing to the first fence to ignite him again. He will have to get him behind something, preferably without horses on both sides of him to get him to settle. Um, he will be conscious of that, but I think it will be well manageable and he will go about doing that early in the Gold Cup. And it should be a good pace with the likes of Native River there. Where in the field do you think Nico de Boyne is going to settle in? Is he going to be tracking the pace? or is he? I think, I, I, I think so. I think he'll ride him fifth, sixth, somewhere in that area, seventh maybe. It's like this, Lydia. He's either going to stay or he's not. Um, I think he will. He's either good enough or he's not. I don't think dropping him right in um, is, is going to be productive. I would be riding him somewhere there down the inside where on the whole second circuit, you'd always be going, whoa, champ, wait, rather than we need to get a bit closer, champ. And if your album photo and connections of album photo, how worried are you by that? Because that's a substantial rival, isn't it? Of course it is. Um, bloody, it, it, it definitely is. Would album photo have done that? I'm not sure. Mm. But the one guarantee you have with album photo is how strong he is at three and a quarter miles. And that's still an uncertainty for champ. True, but it is, although he was staying on strongly at the end of the RSA last season. Um, in a press conference earlier this week, Willie Mullins was saying that he, on reflection, he thinks that the horse might have been a little bit short at Tremor, and so and that might account for um, how um, slightly lethargic he was at times, but he got through it, and he is um, he was having a big piece of work this week. Is that right, Ruby? Yeah, he's in great order. He worked really well. Um, I think Paul and, and Willie and everybody else is, is really, really happy with him, so fingers crossed for him. I mean, it's... It's a third goal cup. It'd be amazing. It would be. It's going to be a fantastic race. And uh, Champ has just made it that bit better. Right, let's talk about the Demon Chase, the Beppo Demon Chase, which was Champless. Uh, we had a good finish to it between Secret Investor, well ridden, seeing off Clandis Oboe. Yeah, and Secret Investor booked out. But I think from a goal cup point of view, Lydia, I think we ruled one out more than ruled anything in in this race. And that's lost in translation. If you look at him, jumps the second fence and on landing, Robert Power looks perfectly happy with him. But at the cross fence, he's a bit slow. And on landing, Robbie has to give him a squeeze and, and get him back on the bridle and get him going again. Um, a really good jump, sort of seven fence maybe in the back straight, you think. Yeah, he's happy and Everton's going really well. Round into the home straight. He's coming to deliver his challenge, but Secret Investor is building it up and building it up. Clanda Zobo is going to challenge him. At three, third last, you're thinking, mm, maybe. Second last, it's a little less doubtful. And then he just capitulates. And by the time he gets to the last fence, it even looks too big for him. And he clambers out over it. So, look, I think he's a horse that has regressed uh, this season for whatever reason. And, no, I think that's uh, disappointing for his connections to have such a talented horse that it seems to be going so backwards at such a red or not. 
It really does with a second operation to correct his breathing, not seemingly having helped. Secret investors seeing off Clan de Zobo. They're both heading towards the bowl at Aintree. Afterwards, Harry Cobden was saying of Clan de Zobo that he felt that he wasn't getting the help he needed from the final fence. Yeah, look, how Harry was on his back. He, he probably could feel it better than any of us could see it. It didn't look it, but he was riding him. He must have felt it. Um, but I think Bryony had kept a bit up her sleeve and was Clanda Zobo was getting to her on Secret Investor, he just kept finding a bit more. Officially, there wasn't that much between them with the weight scale and that. And it probably maybe surprised everyone in Ditch Heat, but I doubt it surprised the handicapper. Absolutely. Right. OK. Uh, another outsider or potential outsider for the Gold Cup went west in surname. Now, I don't think either you or I thought that he was a, a likely Gold Cup contender, but Paul Nichols had been talking him as a potential player in the race. He ran in the Ascot chase at the course that he has done so well at in the past and he didn't run well. No, he didn't and never got in control of the race. You saw him going to the start, you're thinking, wow, the cheap pieces really have worked. But in the race, he could never get loose on the front like he has done at Ascot in the past and the ra Dashiell Drasher was always able to keep up to him and it was really obvious to me down to Swindley Bottom on the second circuit that Dashiell Drasher was way too close to an unsung surname. Surname never got away from him and I think Matt Griffiths was well aware of that because he kept squeezing forward on Dashiell Drasher to make sure surname never got away from him and the first chance he got back up from Swindley Bottom he took it off surname. The surname cried enough in, in two strides and um, great to see a uh, smaller yard like Jeremy Scott's with Dashiell Drasher and Matt Griffiths having big success. And um, you know, where he goes, I don't know, but it was a deserving victory for them all. Uh, yeah, it was much deserved. And Jeremy and Camilla Scott also bred Dashiell Drasher. The horse has entered in the Ryanair, but not a definite runner. And um, they're going to look, look after their stable star. Surname Breathing, Paul Nichols said, that he's been intermittently troubled by it and he's troubled by it again and couldn't get loose from them. No, he doesn't quite look the horse he was. He doesn't. Or okay. anywhere near the horse he was. No, no, he he doesn't. But uh, Paul Nichols said that he clearly likes the challenge of surname. So <gasps> we might we might yet see <laughs> another day. <laughs> eyes, eyes, uh, eyebrows raised there with feeling from, from Ruby. Right, OK, let's move on to the hurdle, shall we? The Rendlesham hurdle. This was up at, at uh, Haydock. It featured the return of Lisnagar Oscar from his operation to help his breathing. And it really worked, even though he got beaten. Without doubt, and uh, booked out, and they went a really good gallop in this race, and that was obvious. There was no hurdle at the, win the start at the back of the last hurdle, but if you look at the gap the first two have put between themselves and the rest of the field, by the time they get to the first hurdle, these were really stepping on the gas, and I don't think Liz Nagar Oscar slowed down and fair to him. Now, a strongly run race does suit him. You're always pointing out how strongly run last year's stairs hurdle was. And by the time you got to the fourth last hurdle, look at, that, look at Liz Nagar Oscar on the approach. He pricks his ears. He's a bit left in the tank. Rounds the bend into the home straight. Good jump at three out. Jumps out to his right at the second last. And that leaves a gap for third wind. And he takes full advantage of it. Jumps through and gets away from Liz Nagar Oscar, away from the last hurdle. And you're thinking, well, will he fold or will he keep plugging on? But to be fair to Liz Nagar Oscar, he's run after third wind all the way up to the line. And another half of furlong would have been back in front of him. I thought it was a really pleasing performance. And I'm sure Rebecca Curtis was chuffed with that. And he goes back to Cheltenham now. He will be a good price and you couldn't stop anyone back in him each way. No, I, I very much agree with that. I think he's underestimated um, just because he wanted a very big price last time around. Um, horses in the backwash. Unfortunately, Emma Tom, who I think finished fourth in the Stairs Hurdle last, last year, he didn't run so well and Itchy Feet appeared not to stay. Um, and third wind, I think the winner is in handicaps in the Coral Cup and the Per Temps Hurdle, of which more later. Right, let's move over to Ireland and discuss the Boyne Hurdle because this featured three horses from Jiggenstown um, that we're all looking at. Tiger Roll, obviously, the dual Grand National winner who's also won four times at the festival, Beacon Edge, and also Fury Road, who many people were putting up as um, an each way play in the Stairs Hurdle. Obviously, after his run in last year's per um, Albert Bartlett, even behind Monkfish Ladies Exhibition in front of Time Hill, he, he was an obvious one to most people. This race was run quite steadily. Jack Kennedy jumped out in front, didn't go that strong on, on Fury Road, and even turning into the home straight in the first circuit, you could see how enthusiastic Tiger Roll was, and he was taking a good bite with, with Keith Donahue. And when you swing him into the back straight to the first hurdle down the back, Tiger Roll is like, giving Keith Donahue a, a pretty hard time of it. He was loving it, really. 
the race didn't pick up though until they got back to the third last hurdle. Tiger Raw looked to have his chance going to it the way he was travelling, but he wrapped the third last hurdle and tamely cried enough. Whereas Beacon Edge and Fury Road quickened down to two out, they both jump it really well and they're still quickening up going to the last. Fury Road pings it and you're thinking he'll get home from here with his Alba Bartlett run, but Beacon Edge knuckled down and poor Fury Road out of it. I was slightly disappointed watching the race until I listened to Gordon Elliott afterwards and he explained about the prep he'd had with Fury Road and he thought fitness might have, be- might have beaten him. And listening to Gordon, that's what it looked like on the television. OK, we can actually hear Gordon in his own words. Noel's horse is three pound higher than him on official ratings, and we gave him two. Like so, disappointed to get bet, but the horse didn't do anything wrong. I don't think only um, only just get bet, but a couple of hours just working right the last day he ran, and he had a couple of easy weeks, and they might just you know kind of caught him a bit. And did Tiger roll do roughly what you were hoping, expecting uh, to do, or maybe? Look, a bit I, I thought he'd do better. a little bit more than that. Keith was happy. He said he travelled the tour last, got very very tired on the ground. Um, you know, I was him and home with it to run him in that ground, but I just he, he's such a fresh horse, so I wanted to get running to him, knock the edge off him. But uh, listen, he doesn't know us anything. We'll go to Cheltenham for a cross country race, and whatever's to be will be. Yeah, how much improvement do you think realistically there is in him? For There's Chal- a lot of improvement in him, but like he's absolutely flying at home, Gary, at the moment. He's in serious order, but uh, I'd say he's just getting a bit cuter. That's just soft ground, he just won't go on anymore. Right, so that offers some hope about Fury Road. I thought he jumped the better of the pair between him and Beacon Edge and, and, and got done. So that maybe it explains away. Beacon Edge himself, though, he's improving. He would be trying three miles for the first time in the Stayers Hurdle. I don't necessarily love that as an idea. No, and they're thinking they're going to entry with him, no one needs said. Um, right. And I was probably harsh enough on him after he's run a nace. I thought he was disappointed behind Bacchuson, but... He did have a colic at Christmas time and recovered from that. And he has proved a hell of a lot from his running ace. I think Jigginstown were, were mooting the idea of going to the entry hurdle with him over two and a half. And he's a very good horse who could be a player in that. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Absolutely. Bad news, finally, about Ronald Pump, last year's uh, Paddy Power Stayers Hurdle runner-up. He's not going to make it to the festival, is he, Ruby? No, he was a non-runner at Christmas and we haven't seen him since he chased home Honeysuckle. But he's out, unfortunately. Yeah, he's got a splint, so it's a minor injury, but unfortunately it's an ill-timed one. Right, now we're going to have a look at a couple of races from the weekend that might have implications for handicaps, maybe other races um, at the festival and beyond. We're going to start with Remastered's win at Ascot in the Reynolds Town, Ruby. Yeah, and it was a good performance, Lydia. He beat the machine by four lengths and Kaluki was a long way back in third. Uh, good to see Tom Scoo and David Pipe with a very good horse in their hands. Ultimately, I probably see him as a Randox Grand National horse down the line, more so than a, a novice chaser for this year's festival. But Grand National horses just don't pop up. They're always there. We're watching them. Yes. We probably just don't look far enough forward for them. He certainly jumps superbly, so I, I can see that. He's got options in the Brown Advisory, the National Hunt Chase and the Ultima at the festival. I'd be headed towards the National Hunt Chase or the Ultima, I think, if I, if I were them. He might need testing ground. Possibly, but I still think he's a nice horse, really nice horse. OK. How about the 10-up novice chase that was won by Coco Beach? Yeah, good performance from Coco Beach and Espinito Bello, as he was his biggest danger. We're only going to show you the last where Espinito Bello makes a mistake under Mark Bulger and Coco Beach rallies back to beat him. Coco Beach had obviously won the Tayes days. I probably see both horses as Irish Grand National horses this season, both novices. Novices have a really good record in the race. Um, I think that's where Barry Connell was talking about going with Espinito Bello and Gordon Elliott about Co- with Coco Beach. But look, novices have a huge record in the Irish National and these look like two horses with great chances. OK, we're going to um, focus on the Cheltenham Festival handicaps next week. And it's a good time to tell you that next week is going to be a handicapping special. Um, so make sure you get your questions in about the Cheltenham Festival handicaps. The entries came out this week. The weights will be out next week. So Ruby and I will be discussing those then. But in the meantime, I just want to talk numbers with you, Ruby. Notably small numbers in entries in all of the um, the Cheltenham Festival handicap entries. If we look back over the past five years, the Ultima, the Grand Annual, the Coral Cup, the Paddy Power Plate, and the JRL Group Kim Muir and the Pertemps all have the smallest entries in that time, and all of those bar the Pertemps have the smallest contingent from Ireland as well. So numbers are very much down in all cases. Yeah, well, look, obviously no owners. Um... Nobody's going for a day out. Uh, Brexit costs and whatever COVID-related costs there will be on top of that as well. 
retesting the whole scenario. So look, there's no social orders, I think, this year. And um, to be honest with you, Lydia, I probably never really looked at the handicaps in maybe five days before. And yeah. I can't wait to try and swat all week for next week's show. Just can't <laughs> wait for it. Uh, you, you, you go earlier than me. I tend to wait for the 48-hour eight hour decks to have a look at the, at the handicaps. Well, I probably trying to be, was trying to pick one to ride in those races back then. <laughs> so I might have had a look to have an idea. But um, no, I'm afraid handicapping is not my strongest point. Let's move on to some significant novice performances over the weekend. Soaring Glory, Ruby, won the Betfair hurdle, maintaining the excellent record that novices have in that open handicap. Yeah, he did. And this was a really strongly run renewal as well. And as they flash up by the winning post in front of you, if you look for Soaring Glory, he's about seventh position down the inside, but he's quite a considerable distance off the, off the horses in front. It was a really strong gallop. Um, it's the fifth hurdle. He kind of jumps in all fours, showing that he is a novice. It wasn't the jump of a handicapper. And away from the third last, then we pick him up. He does look to be going relatively well for, for John Joe O'Neill. Makes a mistake at the second last, but comes well back on the bridle going to the last. And as he's getting to the front, he's a bit green, actually, mm -hmm. when he goes to the last, has a look at it, jumps it well and finds plenty on the running. Look, I know I highlighted last week how bad a record winners of the Betfair Hurdle have at the Cheltenham Festival. This horse does look op open to a bit of improvement with that said. John Joe Neil Senior was thinking about about the Supreme. Have to have a have a chat with Connections. Uh, is he um, streetwise enough? Well, I suppose he's just won a bet for hurdles, so he probably probably should be. But I, I suppose his jumping has improved quite a bit. I'd say that run under his belt, the experience of that could improve him quite a bit, rather than take the edge off him. Yeah. Earlier on the same card, Gowell Road won for Nigel and Sam Twiston Davis. He's got ability and plenty of quirks too. He has. It was his fourth start over hurdles, but look, he was second to one Bear Gills on his first start. He was then placed behind Goodball, who he re-opposed here in, in Newbury. But if you watch him at the first hurdle, he has a run around. But in the back straight, going to the second hurdle, he has a really good look at it. He was keen enough and then going to the hurdle. As soon as he passes the fence, he's going to duck out, ducks back in. And he did it at the fourth hurdle as well. In fairness to him, up to the, when he got into the home straight, he gets headed at the third last by Goodball. He has a good look at the second last. And an even bigger look again at the last hurdle. But then when he lands and the jumping is done and Sam Twiston grabs a hold of him, he really did power away from good ball. And he kept at it really well. I'd say he's a horse with a huge engine. He most certainly has his quirks. But he's a pretty good one. I agree with all of that. Um, Sam Twiston Davis afterwards was sort of saying he was hinting that the horse may not be quite streetwise enough for the uh, Supreme. But the horse is trained by Nigel Twiston Davis, Sam pointed out. <laughs> so he might... <laughs> <laughs> he might well run anyway. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, what is streetwise enough? There's not going to be 70,000 people at Cheltenham this year. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a two-mile novice hurdle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Um, but it's going to be very, very good horses. And you've already sort of described the quirks he's got at different at s sections of the race. Yes, but then you factor in the gallop they could go, which might help him settle. He right. could be getting a lead, which would make him easier to ride over the jumps. I would think there's a lot of positives um, that Nigel Twiston Davis will take out of that. <laughs> I'm sure he will. I'm sure we'll end up seeing him in the Supreme um, and all power to Nigel's elbow. Right. Al Philippe, I like this win in the Prestige at Haydock. What did you think of it? I did. Um, I think the race lost a little bit of luster, mind. Um, he sat in midfield early. There was a pretty good gallop. And if, uh, Paddy Brennan looked perfectly happy on him. He speeded around into the home straight last time. Paddy pulls him out from behind Young Bucks, going to the third last. But Bug, Bug, big Young Bucks even does the sprawls and unseats his rider. And then he's left on his own. Jumps the second last. But I suppose then when he jumps the last and the loose horse passes him out and Paddy Brennan knows he's going to win, the horse, to be fair to him, chases the loose horse all the way up the running. He did show plenty of gusto to finish with, with plenty of life. And um, for me... He has to improve a bit, but he impressed you a bit more. Yeah, I think he's a player. I, I think he's going to have to Im improve again, but that was his first go at three miles. He's got the right kind of profile. And uh, yeah, I think we were denied a battle with Young Buck, which is which is a shame. I think we'd have learned more, but I like him. I think he's not to be dismissed in the Albert Bartlett. Um, how about... Young, young Buck. Sorry, I was calling him Young Bucks there for the last three minutes. Young <laughs> Buck. That's right. It's understandable. There are so many of them. Uh, have got that apostrophe S in that one. Happily hasn't. We also had an interesting matchup between Monmiral and Nasalam. It started off as a duel, but in the end, one was well on top, Ruby. 
It, it was, and very much so on top. Nassalam booked out on the Jamie Moore and looked to go an even enough gallop in front, and he was quite happy with it. But when they got back into the home straight to the third last hurdle, Mon Morale just arrived up absolutely galloping over uh, Nassalam, jumped the third last really well, and Nassalam had no answer. And by the time they got to the last hurdle, it was all over. Does it have more of an impact on, on Adagio's form than, than what Mor- Mon Morale is going to do? It, it probably does. Mon Morale is not going to go to the strength, but um, you could see that maybe he is the best juvenile in the UK. I'm glad you're finally coming around to this point of view, Ruby. Some of us have been arguing this for a while. Maybe you have, but I have to see it with my own eyes. I haven't got time to read reams and reams of columns. <laughs> Do you even read one word? No, Dad. Don't, don't, don't answer that. Don't answer that. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> I'm very, very sure. Right, now, you mentioned that at the impact on, on Nassalam and Adagio. Um, I was giving Nassalam a chance of maybe turning things around or at least getting very close to Adagio in a triumph pedal. They've also entered the him the Moors, Natalam, in the uh, Boodles, Fred Winter. Do you think this defeat here might send them in that direction, or do you think they're, they're still more likely to go um, for the triumph? I, I don't know, and a lot will depend on the on the on the, the weights, really. I mean, Quilixius is 140, 144, I think. Santa here 145. So it, a lot will depend on, on what sort of rating they get, how the handicapper reacts for for that Haydock run and um, where it puts Nassalam, I suppose. And that too will reflect on what Gordon Elliott does. I mean, if Quilixius or Zana here, more so Quilixius, I would think, only has to give, if he claims seven off him and then only has to give 10 or 12 pounds to the opposition, it might encourage him to run it. But were he given over a stone and 16 and 18 pounds to the opposition, it might make it less attractive for him to run. So I think a lot will depend, Lydia, when the weights come out and what horses Quilixius will have to give way to. And I think that'll tell you a bigger picture. I was surprised to see Zana here amongst the entries for the uh, Boodles front winter. I was slightly surprised to see St. Sam here, just because um, Willie Mellon seemed to be sizing up as his um, triumph hurdle runner. Um, yeah, in- it, I suppose it's everything's up in the air, and if you're not in, you can't win. So, I mean, you know, St. Sam is 136, uh, Zana here is 144. You know, seven pounds. If someone claimed off, off Quilixius, that brings him back to 137. He'd only have to give a pound to say in Sam, mm-hmm. and a pound's not going to turn around the Leperstown race. So, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? Okay. Um, if they were going to, if the Moors were going to run Nassalam, he's um, rated 141 at the moment. The last two winners were being rated 138 and 139, and the highest rated horse to run in this race was Blood Cottle. We ran off a mark of one four four. So highly rated horses can win this race. They can, yeah, but both of those winners were under one forty. That would be the cutoff for you. Would look well. Stats would tell you that. Right. Thank you very much for answering our question. We asked you, uh, with horses that have two or more entries at the Cheltenham Festival, where would you prefer to run them and why? We've had a great response and I'm going to put all of your views to Ruby now. We're going to start with Quilixios. Quilixios, Ruby, we've just discussed him. Where would you run him? Would you run him in the Boodles Fred Winter or the JCB Triumph Hurdle? JCB Triumph Hurdle, I think you earn your position in the Grade 1 race and he has most certainly earned his. I agree. I think he definitely has and I think he could be some threat because I think the, the, I also think that the track is going to suit him better. Um, old course for the, for the Fred Winter, new course, more stamina for the Triumph, I think it'll be better for him. Look, I don't know. I think you run handicappers in, in handicaps and you're, good, you're lucky enough to own a Grade 1 horse. That's what I'd run. Okay. Royal Pagai. Uh, this is a much debated one. I think we can count out the Brown Advisory where Monkfish is. Rip Trichy has already got that horse. So uh, that horse for that race. So it's essentially the Gold Cup or the National Hunt Chase. Oh, he's a novice. So I'd be taking advantage of the novice race he can run in. Um, some will argue he's won the, the Peter Marsh and he's earned his place in the Gold Cup. I would argue he's a novice and that's the target I would be taking for him. And it, do you think one course might suit him more than the other? Not particularly. None of the distances he's gone. I think when you get up to extreme distances at Cheltenham, both course, the courses don't matter as much. I'd be slightly worried about the fences on either course. Roxana, are we going to disagree here? 
Uh, and it seems that Dan Skelton is leaning uh, towards the mayor's hurdle over the stayers hurdle unless the ground is quick, in which case I go up for three miles. Where would you run, Roxana? I think after watching her at Ascot in the long walk where she came off third best, I would be avoiding Paisley Park and Thyme Hill. And therefore, that would mean I would run in the mayor's hurdle. What, don't you run, aren't you one who says that we should run horses over their correct distances? Yeah, but she's won the mare's hurdle before, so it probably is a correct distance. I'm not going down that wormhole again. Right, OK, this is a great and very, very long conversation involving Kenboy. I'm just loving the, the depth in which uh, Joey, Ryan C, Nick Pulfrey and David Brown have gone into. They're talking about, about Kenboy and whether they would run in the Gold Cup or the Stayers Hurdle. Someone's even thrown in the Ryanair as well. Um, it's a it's a great conversation. Where would you run Ken Boy? I wouldn't run him in the Ryanair anyway. I don't think he's anywhere near fast enough for that. Um, where would I run him? I'd book him out in the Gold Cup, me. And that's what I would do. I think he's, I know he's jumping has been questionable, but he definitely has a higher level of form over fences than he ever had over hurdles. Yes, I agree. Uh, it's just that he hasn't gone well in two Gold Cups now already. Do you think you can change the He was account? dropped in last in the first one and clipped heels at the back of the first. You're hardly going to take that as a, as a guide as to how you've run. And again, he sat in behind a slow pace last year. So I think um, let gallop, maybe. OK. Um, I, I th I'm quite torn with, with Ken Boy. I think possibly wherever he turns up, Cheltenham just simply isn't his track. But... Uh, great debate, guys, uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. Apart from, you know, David Brown, uh, see me after class, please. And we're going to go over there, there and there and the spellings of those. Bob Ollinger, where would you run Bob Ollinger? I showed him in the valley more. Um, I thought he, look, maybe as Fernie Hollow, he wasn't quick enough for at Gorham Park in the maiden hurdle over two miles. I loved what he did in Nace. I loved the way he hit the line. I would be running him in the valley more myself. Uh, I haven't got a strong view, but I think I probably lean towards the Ballymore. Uh, latest exhibition, Mark Smith has been in touch. He says, latest exhibition, National Hunt Chase, based primarily on the fact he cannot beat Monkfish. He should have too much class for what appears to be a bang average field, provided Royal Pagai goes Gold Cup. And he should stay based on his finishing effort in last year's Albert Bartlett. I'm also one at 12 to 1. <laughs> yeah, fair play to you, Mark. <laughs> um, look, without Royal Pagai... He would, he'd be very, very short in the National Hunt Chase. I would probably go there as well. I mean, uh, form tells you Monkfish is just too good for him. That said, Monkfish tipped up. <laughs> You're not in the race, you'd probably cry. But uh, before the race, and that's only afterthoughts, before the race, I would be going to the National Hunt Chase with him. I would take on Royal Pagai over Monkfish. Paul Nolan was thinking about even possibly staying at home rather than banging. Like they yeah, said. and he can go to Ferry House two weeks after for the Ryanair Gold Cup. I think that's what I'd be doing. I, I tend to like Paul Nolan's thinking here. A conversation about a champ between Richard Cook, Jason Jackson and David Porter. Um, they're talking about the Gold Cup. Richard Cook's asking about how the horse is going to be ridden, which I think we've already addressed. Jason is want, wanting to see the horse in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. Um, and uh, David Porter wants to see him in the Ryanair. Of course, he's not entered in either of those races, is he? He's only in the Stayers and the Gold Cup. He can't be supplemented. I'm sure Connections will be able to manage that. But... Uh, I would run him in the Gold Cup. He's a nine-year-old. He needed every yard of the distance to win last year's RSA. I most certainly wouldn't be bringing him back in trip. Debate about put the kettle on between the champion chase. That's what uh, John Robert wants to see. Um, and uh, Brendan, who wants to see put the kettle on in the Libertine Mayor's Chase, the one, the Mrs Paddy Power Chase. Where would you go with put the kettle on? Have I not been saying it all year where I would be going? The Mrs Paddy Power Chase? I'd be running a, a grade one horse in a grade one race. And so I'd be running her in the, in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. And then we've got the conversation about Alaho. This is a good one, Ruby. Um, Yogi, Yogi, I don't know how, to, how you pronounce that. Um, Yogi knows. Come back after school and we'll give you a lesson. Yeah, I'm going to need that, aren't I? <laughs> I don't know my footballers. So I am going to need a lesson on that. You're quite right. Anyway, he says... Um, Alaho in the Gold Cup instead of the Ryanair. Ruby said he doesn't have the speed for the Ryanair, which is more competitive than the Gold Cup now. I'm not sure about that. He also just got, he only just got beaten by Champ last year, despite pulling most of the way. Better ground will help him get the distance as well. Phil Daniel says, Ruby says he hasn't got the speed, yet he's put him up as an anti-post tip. 
Uh, Ruby's a crafty one, is the reply. Don't know about that. Ruby says a lot of things and probably shouldn't be listened to. But um, I think when you look at Alaho in the Albert Bartlett and in the RSA, he has raced twice at Cheltenham over three miles plus and maybe coming down and trip and let Gallop might unlock a, something to make him actually win a race. Okay, so those are our thoughts, the decisions, decisions, and we'll get to know what connections decide to do in the coming days. So it's just left to look ahead to the weekend and potentially some significant action in terms of the juveniles, because this was the weekend that Burning Victory, last year's Triumph Hurdle winner, emerged. And also Triumph Hurdle winners have emerged from the Adonis. They're both run this weekend. Yeah, I think Tritonic in the Adonis and Tihupu in the winning fair would probably be the two obvious ones if they can enhance their claims. There are a few newcomers there as well. If the Pendle, I think it'll be hard to see a Cheltenham winner coming out of that. And the Dovecot, who knows, it might throw up something. And there'll be Grand National clues maybe in the Bobby Joe Chase if Harry has. And we'll reflect on all of that next week. But the main focus of next week's show is the handicaps at the Cheltenham Festival. So we'll be going all over those. And I'm very much looking forward to it. How about you, Ruby? I'm hoping I have enough ink in this pen. Can't wait. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not getting enthusiasm. I need enthusiasm. I just prefer to see that everybody else look through them all and read what other people think about them and then try and decipher it. But the thought of having to do it myself is just not really exciting me. <laughs> Reading columns, not a strong point, as I understand it, Julie, it emerged during the course. Just read but... tips. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like so many people, like so many people. So anyway, we are going to burn the midnight oil. We're going to get on top of all of these handicap races and we'll have a, a full show for you next week. Enjoy the racing this weekend. For now, it's goodbye from me and Ruby. Mm -hmm.